Um, so my name is Nick Tierney. I work at the Telephone Kids Institute, which is an institute I had not heard of before. Uh, it's in Perth. It's attached to the Perth Children's Hospital. So we're in this awesome environment where we have all um, wet lab researchers on one side, like literally split by a glass pane. And then on the other side, there's computation research going on with biostatistics. Um, and I don't know where to look. So kind of like looking at the, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, and so we have uh, this really awesome environment um, inside a hospital where we get to work um, and see with all these people doing stuff with brain tumors and cancer research on one side and other people working in, in epidemiology and, um, and biostatistics. So it's a really cool place to be. Um, the Institute's relatively young, um, but um, does quite well in terms of funding. So we have just under a thousand researchers who work there and we attracted about 60 million dollars of funding this year um so that was really awesome um and yeah um so so far um uh i did my undergrad and psych at uq into um and i finished in, in 2012 um and then i did my phd in statistics here at qt uh, and in that i focused on exploratory data analysis techniques Bayesian statistics and geospatial stats, as well as optimal facility placement. Um, and then I moved on to be a research fellow and a lecturer at Monash University. Um, there I worked on trying to design and improve tools for exploratory data analysis, uh, and also taught introduction to data analysis. So that was mostly um, the outputs that were producing our packages and papers that accompanied them. Um, and I'll talk a bit about those. Um, briefly about exploratory data analysis. This is not something that I really knew about when I did my undergrad in psych, and it definitely felt like this thing where you're almost cheating because you're looking at the data. Because in psych, you spend so much time trying to set up an experiment that when you get to the end of it, it, it feels a bit strange to be exploring your data again, like you're cheating. But it's actually this incredibly useful technique that you need to use. And so there's a lot of time spent in Carrie's office just looking at data and trying to understand like what the data is, what the structure of it is, and um, it's this awesome field. Um, and it's, a, it's this way of analyzing data sets to summarize the main characteristics. Um, and some of the big names in the field are people like John Schuke, Fred Mostella, Bill Cleveland, and Di Cook, Heike Hoffman, Rob Hyman, and Hadley Wickham. Um, I really like this slide here to emphasize the importance of exploratory data analysis. So this is called the Datasaurus Rex. What you have here is um, the same X and Y mean and standard deviation and correlation, um, but completely different structures of your data. And this is the point of this is to illustrate that it's really important to look at your data because you can see all these interesting patterns in it. Otherwise, if you just look at the summary statistics, you might not get the whole picture. Yeah, I think Steph Locke made an R package of the data source rect. But um, yeah, it was really cool. This it came from this um, thing, it was a, I think it was presented at something like InfoBiz, um, which is like a, like a cool conference. And yeah, they used, they used the simulated annealing to get like slowly move all the points yeah, and then yeah, eventually yeah. make these shapes. It's really cool. I think Matt Parker from Stand Up Maths did a video where he interviewed the person as well. Yeah, yeah, cool. Who's, um, who's Matt Parker? He's an Australian comedian who lives in like the UK now, but he mm -hmm. does a traveling group and he does a podcast he has a youtube channel yeah cool yeah right is that the same guy who hosts like the big quiz or the hard quiz or whatever no mm, no he does, he's done a few number file videos. okay yeah cool mm. so, yeah cool recognize yeah yeah the okay i'll check it out um so some of the other things i worked on was uh was vizdat uh, so vizdat was this approach to uh Get a quick overview of your data. So this shows the ozone data set, so the air quality data set. Um, and here we have the columns um, of the data set and the rows um, and the red or the orange here says this is an integer type and the blue says it's numeric and the gray stripes say this is missing. So this is a way to get a quick sense of what your data is, where the missings are. Um, we also worked on a package called Narnia, um, which is to explore your missing values in R. Um, so we added custom geoms to things like ggplot, or not things like to ggplot. Um, so this is a way of 
showing these blue points here are the things that are not missing and the red points are the things that are missing. Effectively, what we do here is we um, impute those values to be 10% below the minimum value, which allows you to shift these missing values back in uh, because otherwise by default, ggplot would emit all of these red points. So what this allows us to see is that we have missing in ozone, but present in solar radiation, all these values here and missing in, in solar radiation, but present in, in ozone are in the bottom section here and missing in both at these values here. Um, so sometimes when you do these kinds of visualizations, you see very clear structures in your missing data. And in this case, we sort of get a sense that they're roughly evenly distributed. Um, but yeah, it's just a way to quickly explore the missing values without having to think about how do I interpolate this? Or so like, how do I impute this? How do I add this in? How do I think about displaying that information? Um, so the red dots there, can I ask a question? Absolutely, yeah. Just interrupted. Um, but the, the red points there, are they on the um, vertical side? So ozone negative, obviously, but ozone can't be negative. So that's just showing you where the red dots, where the missing dots That's right, yeah, that's right. So those are missing for ozone, but present for solar radiation. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean they're negative. Though. That's right, yeah, yeah. So that's a, uh, like, the trick is, you want to show that information and ideally we could create like a separate axis there so they're not yeah. just negative values but yeah. they're always shifted 10 percent below the minimum so then they're kind of it's like a, a way to shift them out there um but yeah a good question it's a bit of an unusual plot um but yeah thank you uh there's other quick summaries so uh, creating Quick things like gg miss bar, which shows you the missings in each of your variables. So this is the same data set. We see here that ozone has the most missings and then, and then solar radiation. Um, this is a really cool plot called an upset plot. This is a way of showing intersecting sets. So one way to think about this would be if you wanted to show the number of things in say like five overlapping circles of a Venn diagram, this is a way to show that. And the upset plot here applied to missing data um, onto this data set called risk factors allows you to look at, say, these five variables here and all the times these all go missing all together at once. So drink days, drink average, smoke last, smoke stop and pregnant. So risk factors is a general risk factors survey data set. So what we can see from this then is that there's 72 values where all these are missing at the same time. And then the next most common is all three of these of these variables are that go missing. And then these two, and then these four, one, two, and then not that one and so on. And it continues up to a point. So it's just a quite a rich diagram that allows you to get a quick sense of what the missing values are doing in your data set. Um, whereas trying to construct this and think about all the ways of tallying this up and then trying to create this visualization is a reasonable amount of work. So again, the name of the game is to explore your data quickly and effectively. Um, recently, uh, the last project I worked at Monash was the Brogau project. And the idea was to try and solve these spaghetti plots. So you have a plot like this and it's kind of hard to get the overall message. This is the um, average heights of men um, with each line being a separate country. Um, and we have all these measurements over time from this archaeology data set. Uh, and so it's a little bit hard to understand here. And we created some methods with, uh, with ggplot facets so you could quickly sample a set of them. So you can, um, I've got a whole other talk on this that I've given before, but the idea is that you can quickly show a sample um, and it'll randomly sample lines from your data set and put them in these facets or you can spread out all of your data evenly onto all of the facets of your data. Um, all, so like all the facets of the ggplot. And so um, these are some of the things that I've worked on, trying to create software to explore data and make things easier for researchers and, anal and analysts. Please, yeah, yeah, no, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, so good question. So this, um, and I am sort of like skimming through this. So thanks, um, there's 
yeah. Um, so this point here is um, we're taking all of the um, all the so with this one, the sampling, we're taking uh, a random sample of lines and we're plotting them across 12 facets. And so we say pick 12 by default and by default pick three. Yeah. Randomly put like one or three of them. With this one, we're saying um, arrange all these points. Uh, so like we stick with 12 again and then we randomly space them all out into those 12. And as I was doing that, I thought it would be nice if there was a way to arrange them. So we're going from say the lowest to the tallest or, or something like that, or the lowest to the, the largest to the smallest, et cetera. So what you can do is you can pass in a variable here to say arrange by this variable. And in this case, it's by year. So we're taking those with the earliest measurements and then going up to the, uh, the latest measurements. And so that's why you see sort of these clear, like one here has the points that start at the earliest year. But then it, it takes those and then it, cuts them into 12 pieces. Um, yeah, for each of the 200 and some odd, oh no, 144 countries, I think, in this data set. Um, so that can just take an arbitrary function as well. Yeah. Um, so now I'm a research software engineer, which is a relatively new title, but I'll unpack in a moment. And as I said, I was working at the Telephone Kids Institute. And within that, I'm working in a group called the Malaria Atlas Project. Um, I work with a bunch of epidemiologists who report to the World Health Organization to report on the current state of malaria in various countries around the world. And um, there's a group of about 20 to 30 of us, um, including say postdocs and research assistants. So a research software engineer, someone who combines a professional software engineering expertise with an intimate understanding of research. Um, this is the, the definition from the Society of Research Software Engineers. Um, and one way that I really liked um, to unpack this, this is from Hardy Seibold's talk. Um, so I'm creating software to solve research problems and I'm, I'm developing tools that abstract the right components to facilitate research and helping researchers to find and learn good tools and supporting researchers with computational reproducibility. If there's time at the end of the talk, I'll talk through some of the software that I've written to help the uh, people on our team um, solve a variety of problems. Um, but I think the thing that I really enjoy is trying to abstract the right components to facilitate research so that researchers don't have to spend a lot of time trying to rewrite things or trying to, um, like, you know, learn computer science and so they can do the research. And while that might suit some fields very well for other people who might want to focus more on the epidemiology. They don't have to spend a lot of time trying to work out how Inla needs your variables arranged so that you can fit a certain type of model. Um, yeah. The main thing I'm working on at the moment is Greta, which is this really awesome statistical modeling software that was created by Professor Nick Golding. Um, and yeah, I'd like to talk about that now. So. Um, the idea with Greta is that you write your statistical model in R and you can inspect it and interact with it in the way that you would R objects. Um, and this is a similar model. This is an example from um, the Winbugs handbook. Um, and this is how you would write it in JAGS or STAN over here. And not to say that writing more things out isn't, um, like it is more explicit here in STAN, um, and then with JAGS here, I guess the, the thing that I find challenging with these pieces of software is that the abstraction is a little bit harder to think about. You have to do a lot of extra work to set things up and set up this model. And also with Stan and JAGS, you have to write this model out and then compile it and sort of hope that it compiles properly the first time. And if it doesn't, you have to think back to all of these other objects that you can't interact with. Whereas with Greta, you create your model and then you can interact with all these components and you get errors that say, oh, you're trying to combine these two things but they're the wrong dimensions, that won't work. So then you go, oh, okay, what dimension is this object? Oh, it's small, I need to make it the same dimension as say the number of people that I have or the number of observations. And I think that's the really powerful thing with Greta. Um, here, um, I'll give a demonstration of what Greta looks like at the end of the talk. Um, so by default, it uses Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, so it's sort of the um, ball rolling algorithm for 
sampling. So you're sort of rolling a ball through like a frictionless surface of a valley. This is the starting point here. Um, say like of a sample and then the ball will roll through. And this is a single sample of these um, two correlated, um, two, I can't remember the exact example from this. This is a paper by Monaghan from 2016 explaining Hamiltonian Monte Carlo for ecologists. Um, but yeah, um, under the hood, it uses Google TensorFlow for like the maths library. Um, this means it can do things like automatic differentiation. It has really efficient linear algebra and it's highly parallel. Um, TensorFlow is this really powerful library that's used for things like object recognition. So this is a, the top right hand corner here shows object recognition in an image saying that these are people and these are kites. Um, it's used for things like Google Translate or for um, how to teach um, an AI to play Mario and beat the game really quickly. Um, so it's a really powerful thing. It's written in Python or it's written in C++ and then there's an interface into it through Python. Um, this means that trying to get it to work through R is a bit of work and that has been a large portion of what my time has been on this year. Um, so um, yeah, um, Red is also extendable and so Nick has written a bunch of really awesome extensions for dynamic systems or for GANs or for Gaussian processes. So he's written out an example where you can define a Gaussian process, um, so like a, a radial basis function here, uh, and then adding a bias, saying this is a Gaussian process, and then you can project and make a plot like this. Um, so yeah, the idea of Greta is to provide this way to interact with a statistical model in R that also allows you to write your own extension packages and um, and yeah, some of the recent changes I've been making this year was improving the installation of TensorFlow and Python uh, dependencies. Um, as much as I really hoped that that was like something that was going to take me a week, that was like several months of work. Um, <laughs> also starting with a new code base of like, um, I used to have the numbers, but it's somewhere in the region of like 40,000 lines of code. Um, and just trying to sit with that and understand how to read that code and um, what it does and how everything works. Um, we, we overhauled uh, the error message uh, display system, which meant reading all the error messages to make sure that they're phrased in ways that are gonna be really helpful. Um, and then a whole bunch of various bug fixes related to things like R Studio not detecting Python in the latest release, um, updates to TensorFlow that broke everything because um, the TensorFlow update changed the way that you get a dimension out. Um, so instead of a list, it was a vector, which broke everything in Greta uh, just before we were to teach a course. Um, so <laughs> that, was, that was good. Um, but uh, yeah, there's been a lot of little bits and pieces here. Um, and yeah, there's really awesome stuff like this calculate uh, function in Greta that's really flexible that allows you to do things like prior uh, predictive simulation uh, and also posterior predictive simulation. Um, and yeah, it's just really cool. Um, so some of the next things I've been wanting to work on, so marginalization. So there's a way that Nick has worked out so you can work with uh, discrete uh, variables um, with this marginalization interface. Um, because if you're using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you can't use uh, discrete variables. Um, and yeah, some samples for big data and other extension uh, packages and also looking at adding um, the nuts sampler, uh, the no U-turn sampler in the future as well. Um, yeah. Oh, and why Greta? So um, the name Greta is named after Greta Herman, um, who wrote the first algorithms for computer algebra before computers were invented. Um, and it was spelled Greta because we didn't want people, Nick didn't want our people to say greet, um, which is like the German writing of that. Um, so hence Greta. And um, yeah, just thought, I think that's a really awesome thing that Nick has done. Um, and yeah, I didn't know about Greta Hammond. So um, now I was going to give a quick demo. Um, get this thing out of the way. Can I first question right Yeah. Um, is there a way to, if you have some very strange like likelihood or some strange prior, mm -hmm. is there a way to find that yourself in the model? 
Yeah, so we're working on a way to, so like you want to create your own, say, distribution or something like that. Yeah, so like not I just like. Say, so it's like station requires also a bit funky. Mm -hmm. And so you have to define it yourself. Like in standard physics, it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. I'm calling that possibly. Yeah, so with the spatial modeling, I know some people have actually just looking at um, this is a good example to show off. So there's a forum uh, for Greta. So um, if you go to the Greta website, um, that's greta stats.org, there's like this little bubble here, which will take you to the Greta forum and you can ask questions. Um, someone has worked on creating a spatial model in Greta to say, like a car, like using a car prime, for example. Um, and then there's been some discussion on this, but um, I haven't looked into this specifically. I know that there's, like, I want to say yes, but I'm not 100% sure here. But um, there are people who've asked questions like this on the forum. So that could be a good point there. Um, we don't have a lot of traffic on the forum, but I do try and check it um, a couple of times a week. And so if you do have questions, um, especially with installation at the moment, um, because if you can't install the software, you can't use it. Um, so I'm really keen to get that working. But if you have any other curly questions, then um, yeah, that's where I'd recommend starting there. Um, so let's take a look at, this is, we recently ran a course um, uh, on, on how to use Greta. So I thought I'll just run through one of the examples that we gave with the penguins data set. Uh, it was two days, so two four hour sessions. Um, so if you haven't seen the Palmer penguins, this is a, um, a cool data set that's like an alternative to Iris um, based on, so it has very similar structure. This is these um, three penguin species are the Adelie, Chinstrap and Gentoo. Um, and it has, if you know the Iris data set, I feel like a lot of statisticians could almost draw out all of the points for um, all the different sepal lengths and sepal widths and species and so on. Um, it has kind of similar structure um, and it's just nice to use a different data set. Um, and also there's some really cool artwork uh, that Alison Horst has made, which I think is really cool. Um, so we are going to take a look at that data. Um, before we can do anything else, we need to tidy up the data. This is basically just scaling all of the data. And uh, so scaling them. So these variables here are going to have mean zero and, and standard deviation one. Um, what we want to fit is say a model like this, like a, um, so we want to fit something where we have, we're predicting if the penguins are, are female, um, and we would use a like a logit link, logit link function with a linear predictor where we have some some intercept and then some coefficient for the flipper length and the body mass. Say, so with the GLM, your model might look like this: um, is female numeric being predicted by the flip, uh, the flipper length scaled or the body mass scaled? Um, and yes, that's what your model would look like with GLM. Um, First we load Greta, um, takes a little moment. Uh, and then it's gonna test out a new function. Uh, yes, yeah, after the penguins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there are in a few papers on this. This is one of the things they're doing, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, we would say our intercepts, like in our coefficients of the flip length and body mass, we would give these a prior of say like normal 0, 10, just to start out with something quite vague. Uh, as we start this off, Greta has to connect to Python and check dependencies. So it just takes a moment to initialize that. And if we look at these priors here, our intercepts, uh, it says this is a Greta array and it's a variable following a normal distribution. Um, it has a question mark there because it, uh, the way Greta works is that it sort of stores all these as placeholders and then you eventually you put these together into a model object and you can do MCMC on it. So then we can take these, uh, we take this intercept and we add it to our coefficient and we multiply that by the data. So we take our penguins data um, and, and that variable and then we 
and we multiply by the other. So like this just looks like something we might see sort of in a linear model. Um, and we put that into our variable eta. And if we look at eta, eta is now something that's 333 long. Um, that's the number of n over uh, of rows in the penguin stage set. Um, so we've grown out this thread array in something that matches the dimensions of that data. We then apply a link function onto this. And then when we then say that this variable is female numeric, we'll follow, um, so we're saying like this is the distribution, this is the likelihood, this follows a Bernoulli our distribution. We then put this into a model object. And one of the things I really like about this is if we were to plot this, we get out a nice DAG here that you can inspect and look at. That you can inspect and look at. Uh, there we go. I think it uses diagram R. Yeah. Um, and yes, we have a DAG here with these, uh, these diagonals representing our distributions um, through our parameters and these are the parameter values. Um, so yeah, it's kind of nice to get out something that represents your model and you can see and look at uh, and check um, that that all, all makes sense. There is a few more like extra things going on here that's saying it's multiplying or setting dimensions. Um, writing out these kinds of visualizations is, is a bit hard. <laughs> And so we're looking at cleaning that up slightly, but um, yeah. So then we can run MCMC on it. And by default, that'll set for a thousand on each. Um, uh, it'll run for four chains with a thousand um, samples of, of adaptive sampling. Um, and we get a little progress bar. Take a moment to run. Um, one thing that's worth noting with Threader is that it, if you were to code this up in JAGS, my guess would be that this would probably be quite fast like initially. But if you have a lot and a lot of parameters um, and you have a lot of data, then it'll still scale quite well because of using things like TensorFlow. Um, and again, I think the one of the benefits I like to think of these things is like saving your human cycles. So the CPU cycles here might be slightly slower, but if you can make sure that you get your model defined correctly and you can verify that and interact with the object, then maybe you can be more certain that the model is going to be what you think it is. Um, and then, yeah, we can use the default plots from Coda to get a, like, a sense of what the trace plots and the densities are. And um, see what our convergence diagnostics look like. Looking at the Gelman diagnostic, so it's around about one, which is good. And uh, what we'd hope for. So um, yeah, that's a rough introduction to how Greta works and how you can interact with it. Um, the really cool thing I think here is the idea that all of these objects know about each other. So that's uh, to do with the way that Nick has defined this quite clever system. Um, so when you, so like intercept is used here and then eta is used there and eta is defined in probability female. Um, and so like all these objects know who their parents are and then that's what allows it to create this DAG structure, which then allows you to do all this really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, I was wondering what, I mean, that's pretty much the end of my presentation, like a quick demo, a quick overview of Greta and what's coming up and what I've been working on. Um, yeah, I'll end there. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, I'd welcome them. So thank you. So can you talk a little bit about how Greta is being used for the malaria project? Yeah, well, um, it's a good question. So Nick Golding is the director of Malaria Ecology at the um, at the Malaria Atlas project, and he started working on um, the old coronavirus, and then has not mm -hmm. stopped working on COVID. So it's actually mostly ended up being 
used in things like the code, uh, like the COVID forecasts, so the the uh, the estimates for the uh, the R effective uh, and things that go out and um, forecast and reports every week to the government. So it's been used there. It's been used um, to get recent estimates and comparisons of what of what Omicron is uh, compared to Delta. So he um, he uses that, and our team uses Greta now to create these kinds of models. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it has also been applied in ecology. Nick has got some brief examples on the website. Um, I'm not sharing screen at the moment, but on the examples page, there's uh, some examples of some of some common ecological models. Um, but yeah, it is used um, every week and has been used over the past 18 months to produce estimates um, for things like the Doherty modeling, which you might have seen on the news. Um, yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It's um it's kind of funny. I've been a bit isolated from I haven't used Greta that much outside of teaching this course. And it's kind of this interesting angle from the software side of um understanding what people need and want if they're using statistical software but not having used the software as much. But then seeing other people at the institute use it and getting feedback from them. Um but yeah. Mm, yeah, um, uh, I really like the structure of Greta. It does all look really nice. And I was wondering, um, uh, is that what drew people like in this industry with, with more broader statistics application mm -hmm. to using Greta over a competitor to stand? Or was there something mm -hmm. else? With yeah, I think so. Nick started working on this initially, I think, just because of a sense of frustration of not being able to see how and why like your model is compiling or what the errors are like initially or that kind of sense. And also the, um, in some sense, like it's a bit ironic because installing it now is still hard with Python, but installing a basic modeling software isn't usually that straightforward. And so I think that was a lot of the frustration there was like this installation pain and this sense that you couldn't interact with your model as much as you would like. Um, and then I think the idea here of this interactive way of using Bayesian modeling software, I think matches really well to how people use R because a lot of people don't tend to write out scripts in R that tend to interact with the, and R like is created as an interactive um, statistical software. And so I think it comes from that place of wanting to interact with your statistical model. Um, and then also in the future, what is quite cool is that Nick has written out Greta in such a way that we don't actually need to use something like TensorFlow. So in the future, we might swap it out for things like you could have a slower version in base R, or we could swap it out for things like PyTorch or other linear algebra libraries. So in the future, we might be able to swap it out for things that are um, that are updating and changing. So then we don't um, we're not tied to one specific um, tech company like Google. Um, yeah. Oh, Josh. You, you might have just answered my question. Oh, yeah. can you hear me? That sound off. It's my bad. How about now? Yeah. Yay. Um, you might have just answered this question implicitly in your last question. Um, but I was wondering when you talk about the objects that you have in your uh, um, code, do they know about each other? in R or in the Python backend? Like, yeah, is the, do the objects exist in Python or do they exist just in R? I think, so they're calling, so when you create an object, it creates, uh, so like a Greta array is an R array with um, like a node structure, so then it, gets like this information of an, like of inheritance. Um, I believe at that point, say before you run model, it would just be using, just be using R and it would sort of make all these promises to run things in TensorFlow. And then when you do the MCMC or you do the calculation on those things, then you would, that's when I guess it, the things would be written to Python, but um, I'm not actually hundred percent sure if it is 
translated to Python immediately? Is there like a reason you ask, like, did you want to pass these into Python, uh, for example? Or I was just wondering whether the like hierarchical like system was in R or whether it was in Python. Yeah, so like all the hierarchical system is from an R six class. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe that was a better question. Oh no, that's yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, I also wanted to know. Side question. Mm -hmm. I'll just hijack this meeting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, is the have those upset plots been used to um, do viz for decision trees? I haven't seen them in decision trees. I think they were initially used in genomics. I think um, it's a really good paper on the upset plot, but um, I haven't seen them for decision trees. So you'd be imagining something there with like like class prediction or uh, like covariates that are or like um, yeah covariates that are together in one tree get mm -hmm. put together in the plot. And then if you've got a Bayesian decision tree, you can have like the uncertainty in the bars mm. about, yeah, how much it varies. Yeah, cool. No, that sounds awesome. Um, the, yeah, sounds good. I'm into it. Um, I think okay. the uncertainty part, like the upset plot isn't, all the way we generate that is with this R package. It's quite rigid and structured, but um, effectively you need to create like a one hot encoding of your data of where the things are in each other category, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Leah. Hey, awesome talk. Thank you. Um, I don't really have any questions, but I was wondering if you could maybe share the slides because I was look interested in looking at some of the links in more detail. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so if you go to, um, I'll just put the link there, but that should take you to the slides and then those are on GitHub. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give them to, I'm trying to think about who sent out the talk link, but, um, I can post it on Slack as well, if you like. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Yeah, in, in the other world, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. So at the moment, yeah, my... Yeah. <laughs> so isn't it both? Yeah. yeah, I guess both. Yeah, so, well, it's... um. As a research software engineer, my I'm not like so software is now treated as my main output. And then with the software will be small papers submitted to places like the Journal of Open Statistical Software, open source software, sorry. Which is like the number one journal for the number of people. Well, it's confusing. So there's actually two. So this is yeah, and I just like mix them together because they're so okay. similar. So the Journal of Statistical Software is JSS, which is a really popular journal, but also has like a I don't know. Yeah, I actually nearly did like an, an analysis where I scraped all of the start and end times of the, but yeah, it was a little bit sad because it was somewhere in the region of 18 months from yeah. like acceptance to publication. Um, so sometimes like, yeah, currently like, I, anyway, it's a really good journal. It's just that, yeah, it might take you like three years to yeah. get your paper published. Um, the Journal of Open Source Software is really cool. And I'll see if I can just share my screen and show you it. Um, the idea of JOS is that you write a, you write your software um, and then you submit a small abstract um, and then that gets, and the software gets peer reviewed. So the issue I find with statistical software or any software that you're writing for research is that you have to write the code, you have to write the tests, you have to write the documentation, and then you have to write a paper about the software. And that's like, you're writing things so many times um, already. So um, when you submit a paper to JOS, um, I'll say I'll log in with my ORCID ID, which I think still uses my QT one. There we go. Uh, so I'll log in through there. Um, 
And when you submit, you just provide the link to where your software lives. Um, the software version and then the type of submission. So if it's new or if it's like a major uh, and so on. And then that's that's it. That's it. That's the submission process. Um, and that's completely an academic process. Uh, well, it, it still then gets. Um, no, I didn't mean that in a decision way. That was enough. Like I want to say myself a bunch of time kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. So it is. Uh, they've currently published now a thousand papers. Yeah. Um, you get a DOI. It's like it's a real paper. Um, they initially, or like the creators of Joss, admit that it is like a hack around like the the system, but it kind of works. And um, it hasn't been recognized on places like Scamago Junior. I don't know how to say that. Scamago Junior. I don't know why it's Junior or Journal Ranking. Anyway. <laughs> so uh yeah it um but like for example in my job um at the moment that was one of the things we agreed on was that my my academic output would be software and then and like and then those with the papers which would be the official way to try how to track the citation things like packages on cran now get tracked by google scholar so um yeah so that can also be a way to track citations. Um, but I think a paper is a little bit more robust um, because it looks like the things people know about. Um, and yeah, I think um, on the other side of things, like I really enjoyed teaching and I'm not teaching in my current role outside of courses. Um, I really value teaching. It's just that um, it's, it's hard to do it all. Um, and so that's like a thing that I've noticed that is is different. I've just got more time to write software and write code. And those are some of the things that I found that I was getting a lot of joy out of. And so it's been really awesome to be able to hone in on that and focus on it. Um, yeah, and I can show you, um, I can show you some of the, I am screen sharing good. Um, so some of the things I've been doing, say like with malaria modeling. So this is a, um, this is a pared down version of say um, some of the data cleaning that someone would have to do for who regions, who subregion and, and countries. Um, they have to create these individual IDs in addition to the who region. So this will then be a variable that say one through to how many regions there are. So turning it from something that says like a name to one, two, three, four, et cetera. Um, the reason you have to do that is because Inla requires that you can't pass the same variable. It has to be like a different name and it has to be numbered. So um, then um, what we did was we wrote out a, um, this is our interface to like a hierarchical time series um, here with this package called Yahtzee. So yet another hierarchical time series extension expansion because coming off names is hard. But, um, <laughs> And so you're taking some prevalence and then say having the average lower age and then hierarchical time series of these special things there. And that would then write out um, a whole lot of code in Inla and it would do all this transformation of the data for you and return an Inla object. So then you don't have to write out all of this data transformation code and then all this modeling code. Admittedly, that's for a very specific use case. This is for people who fit a very specific model all the time. Um, but it was really satisfying because you could see that researchers were doing the same thing all the time and they had like hundreds and hundreds of lines of code to do all this data cleaning and then they can write out something relatively short and succinct that does what they want. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I get to think about and work with and um, it's been really, really cool. Mm. It's yeah. good. Like it's... Um, yeah, it's like all of the beaches, even the bad beaches, like the water's still really clear, like the, the clarity of like Stradbroke Island, but like a, a 20 minute drive. Um, and um, as everyone says, like it's a dry heat. <laughs> um, I feel like it's like this, almost like this parody of like, when you get to Brisbane, it's like, oh, it's the humidity. And then over like West, it's like, it's so dry, it's so good. So you can be outside in a 36 degree day and not sweat, which is really weird. Um, they do feel like you're mildly roasting. Um, <laughs> Josh said for, forecast of 41. Yeah. Um, I think it's forecast to be 28 here in Brisbane on Christmas Day. So that's awesome. Um, 
Possibly raining though. Possibly raining. That's rare. Oh, actually, you're the rainfall. Oh, no, yeah. I'm not on duty. You're on duty. Yeah. Today. <laughs> um, no, it's been good. It's been a good move. Um, and yeah, I think the biggest change was also going from Melbourne and being in lockdown to being over west and being um, free. Yeah. But um, it's been good. Telephone kids has such a good reputation. Yeah, it's, it's a. Uh, really there's yeah, they're awesome. I I didn't even know that they yeah like it's um yeah it's awesome. They actually seem to genuinely really care about like I don't know. It's not that like I think like just because it's smaller as well, like you sort of feel a bit more connected to everyone there. And I also just really love that you can look over and there's like people doing pipetting and other stuff. Um, I've never worked in a wet lab, so <laughs> it's like really amazing to me. But, um, yeah. I think your bedding's a great mystery. Your is a great mystery. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like I feel like I can teach people to code, but then like trying to teach me to use a wet lab feels like a like a biohazard risk. <laughs> um, That's how we end up with the next code. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So we did see like a, a rogue mosquito in the office the other day. Um, <laughs> but apparently they don't actually have live mosquitoes in there, so it was fine. Cool. Does anyone have any other questions on? I was online? talking to this guy. I'm sorry, I'm right yeah, on track. Yeah, it's good. The mosquitoes. But they were talking about malaria and I'm talking about dengue actually. Oh, yeah. And all of the sort of the different um, uh, trials to reduce dengue. And one of them is around um, sterilizing the male mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. And yeah. releasing those. Mm. And so they irradiate the mosquitoes, the male mosquitoes, to sterilize them and then release them out. And then they, they mate with the females and there's no offspring. So anyway, this guy was saying that male mosquitoes that have been irradiated actually have a different pitch to their, their signal when they whine, you know how mosquitoes whine? It's actually a different whine. So he was, we were at this, at this meeting and he was describing the way the mosquitoes actually whine. He worked with mosquitoes for about 20 years, so he had it down, you know, and he goes, you know, they sort of go like, <laughs> And then there's the ones that have been around here. They go, oh, like this. and we were just laughing and laughing about the difference in radiated mosquitoes and those that didn't. So it is. So I'd let you know that. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting, interesting hearing about all the experiments. to the intellectual discussion. Yeah. Oh, the wet lab stories I hear are pretty crazy. Like, Nick had to make like a, his own custom syringe by melting glass in a special device and then snapping it off so he could um inject a virus into a midgy but to catch a midgy you have to get it to like full unconscious and you do that by pumping carbon dioxide into a, a chamber which then means you have to have a carbon dioxide alarm and like be locked into like a, a sealed room with these and then so then like they all like fall down as they pass out and then you have to inject them with this like special syringe you've made but the syringe is like the width of their body and it's like a like a midgy so you have to get it like just right and then and then you end up like kind of killing all the images. But it's, <laughs> it's just, like, yeah, it's like all this, all these like yeah, these all things these they have to do. Complain about you know having to sedate horses or elephants or something, and then a midge is yeah, all <laughs> yeah, it's like one of the beasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah oh, okay. But if anyone would like to install Greta or has any questions about that, we'd be really happy to help you and watch oh, and yeah we should talk about the the course at some point yeah yeah that'd be good yeah we ran through the stat society this year and it went really well it was it was good um yeah small class about 30 people i had about like four instructors so it's really good mm. yeah cool well thanks so much nick yeah it was really great to have you and um he talked about Greta and the journey to getting to the Telethon Kids Institute. Yeah, oh, thanks, Josh. All right, I'll catch you later. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. All right, see you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yay.